October 9th, Daily Video Bible Reading from the Net Bible, Jeremiah chapters 32 and 33 from the Old Testament. In the tenth year that Zedekiah was ruling over Judah, the Lord spoke to Jeremiah. That was the same as the eighteenth year of Nebuchadnezzar. Now at that time the armies of the king of Babylon were besieging Jerusalem. The prophet Jeremiah was confined in the courtyard of the guardhouse attached to the royal palace of Judah. For King Zedekiah had confined Jeremiah there after he had reproved him for prophesying as he did. He had asked Jeremiah, Why do you keep prophesying these things? Why do you keep saying that the Lord says, I will hand this city over to the king of Babylon. I will let him capture it. King Zedekiah of Judah will not escape from the Babylonians. He will certainly be handed over to the king of Babylon. He must answer personally to the king of Babylon and confront him face to face. Zedekiah will be carried off to Babylon and will remain there until I have fully dealt with him. I, the Lord, affirm it. Even if you continue to fight against the Babylonians, you cannot win. So now Jeremiah said, The Lord told me, Hanamel, the son of your uncle Shalom, will come to you soon. He will say to you, Buy my field in Anathoth, because you are entitled as my closest relative to buy it. Now it happened just as the Lord had said. My cousin Hanamel came to me in the courtyard of the guardhouse. He said to me, Buy my field, which is at Anathoth, in the territory of the tribe of Benjamin. Buy it for yourself, since you are entitled as my closest relative to take possession of it for yourself. When this happened, I recognized that the Lord had indeed spoken to me. So I bought the field at Anathoth from my cousin Hanamiel. I weighed out seven ounces of silver and gave it to him to pay for it. I signed the deed of purchase, sealed it, and had some men serve as witnesses to the purchase. I weighed out the silver for him on a scale. There were two copies of the deed of purchase. One was sealed and contained the order of transfer and the conditions of purchase. The other was left unsealed. I took both copies of the deed of purchase and gave them to Barak, son of Neriah, the son of Messiah. I gave them to him in the presence of my cousin Hanamiel, the witnesses who had signed the deed of purchase, and all the Judeans who were housed in the courtyard of the guardhouse. In the presence of all these people, I instructed Barak, the Lord God of Israel, who rules over all, says, Take these documents, both the sealed copy of the deed of purchase and the unsealed copy. Put them in a clay jar so that they may be preserved for a long time to come. For the Lord God of Israel, who rules over all, says, Houses, fields, and vineyards will again be bought in this land. After I had given the copies of the deed of purchase to Barak, son of Neriah, I prayed to the Lord. O oh Lord God, you did indeed make heaven and earth by your mighty power and great strength. Nothing is too hard for you. You show unfailing love to thousands, but you also punish children for their sins of their parents. You are the great and powerful God who is known as the Lord who rules over all. You plan great things and you do mighty deeds. You see everything people do. You reward each of them for the way they live and for the things they do. You did miracles and amazing deeds in the land of Egypt, which have had lasting effects. By this means you gain both in Israel and among humankind a renown that lasts to this day. You use your mighty power and your great strength to perform miracles and amazing deeds and to bring great terror on the Egyptians. By this means you brought your people Israel out of the land of Egypt. You kept the promise that you swore on oath to their ancestors. You gave them a land flowing with milk and honey. But when they came in and took possession of it, they did not obey you or live as you had instructed them. They did not do anything that you commanded them to do. So you brought all this disaster on them. Even now siege ramps have been built up around the city in order to capture it. War, starvation, and disease are sure to make the city fall into the hands of the Babylonians who are attacking it. Lord, you threatened that this would happen. Now you can see that it is already taking place. 
The city is sure to fall into the hands of the Babylonians. Yet in spite of this, you, Lord God, have said to me, buy the field with silver and have the transaction legally witnessed. The Lord answered Jeremiah, I am the Lord, the God of all humankind. There is indeed nothing too difficult for me. Therefore, I, the Lord, say, I will indeed hand this city over to King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon and the Babylonian army. They will capture it. The Babylonian soldiers that are attacking the city will break into it and set it on fire. They will burn it down along with the houses where people have made me angry by offering sacrifices to the god Baal and by pouring out drink offerings to other gods on the rooftops. This will happen because the people of Israel and Judah have repeatedly done what displeases me from the earliest history until now, and because they have repeatedly made me angry by these things they have done, I, the Lord, affirm it. This will happen because the people of this city have aroused my anger and my wrath since the time they built it until now. They have made me so angry that I am determined to remove it from my sight. I am determined to do so because the people of Israel and Judah have made me angry with all their wickedness. They, their kings, their officials, their priests, their prophets, and especially the people of Judah and the citizens of Jerusalem have done this wickedness. They have turned away from me instead of turning to me. I tried over and over again to instruct them, but they did not listen and respond to correction. They set up their disgusting idols in the temple, which I have claimed for my own and defiled it. They built places of worship for the god Baal in the valley of Ben-Hinnom so that they could sacrifice their sons and daughters to the god Molech. Such a disgusting practice was not something I commanded them to do. It never even entered my mind to command them to do such a thing. So Judah is certainly liable for punishment. You and your people are right in saying war, starvation, and disease are sure to make the city fall into the hands of the king of Babylon. But now I, the Lord God of Israel, have something further to say about the city. I will certainly regather my people from all the countries where I will have exiled them in my anger, fury, and great wrath. I will bring them back to this place and allow them to live here in safety. They will be my people and I will be their God. I will give them a single-minded purpose to live in a way that always shows respect for me. They will want to do that for their own good and the good of the children who descend from them. I will make a lasting covenant with them that I will never stop doing good to them. I will fill their hearts and minds with respect for me so that they will never again turn away from me. I will take delight in doing good to them. I will faithfully and wholeheartedly plant them firmly in the land. For I, the Lord, say, I will surely bring on these people all the good fortune that I am hereby promising them. I will be just as sure to do that as I have been in bringing all this great disaster on them. You and your people are saying that this land will become desolate, uninhabited by either people or animals. You are saying that it will be handed over to the Babylonians but fields will again be bought in this land. Fields will again be bought with silver and deeds of purchase signed, sealed, and witness. This will happen in the territory of Benjamin, the villages surrounding Jerusalem, the towns in Judah, the southern hill country, the western foothills, and southern Judah. For I will restore them to their land. I, the Lord, affirm it. The Lord spoke to Jeremiah a second time while he was still confined in the courtyard of the guardhouse. I, the Lord, do these things. I, the Lord, form the plan to bring them about. I am known as the Lord, I say to you. Call on me in prayer and I will answer you. I will show you great and mysterious things which you still do not know about. For I, the Lord God of Israel, have something more to say about the houses in this city and the royal buildings, which have been torn down for defenses against the siege ramps and military incursions of the Babylonians. The defenders of the city will go out and fight with the Babylonians, but they will only fill those houses and buildings with the dead bodies of the people that I will kill in my anger and my wrath. That will happen because I have decided to turn my back on this city 
on account of the wicked things that they have done. But I will most surely heal the wounds of the city and restore it and its people to health. I will show them abundant peace and security. I will restore Judah and Israel and will rebuild them as they were in the days of old. I will purify them for all the sins that they have committed against me. I will forgive all their sins which they have committed in rebelling against me. All the nations will hear about all the good things which I will do to them. The city will bring me fame, honor, and praise before them for the joy that I bring it. The nations will tremble in awe at all the peace and prosperity that I will provide for it. I, the Lord, say, you and your people are saying about this place, it lies in ruins. There are no people or animals in it. That is true. The towns of Judah and the streets of Jerusalem will soon be desolate, uninhabited either by people or by animals. But happy sounds will again be heard in these places. Once again, there will be sounds of joy and gladness and the glad celebrations of brides and grooms. Once again, people will bring their thank offerings to the temple of the Lord and will say, Give thanks to the Lord who rules over all, for the Lord is good and his unfailing love lasts forever. For I, the Lord, affirm that I will restore the land to what it was in days of old. I, the Lord who rules over all, say, This place will indeed lie in ruins. There will be no people or animals in it, but there will again be in it and in its town sheepfolds where shepherds can rest their sheep. I, the Lord, say that shepherds will once again count their sheep as they pass into the fold. They will do this in all the towns in the southern hill country, the western foothills, the southern hill country, the territory of Benjamin, the villages surrounding Jerusalem, and the towns of Judah. I, the Lord, affirm, the time will certainly come when I will fulfill my gracious promise concerning the nations of Israel and Judah. In those days and at that time, I will raise up for them a righteous descendant of David. He will do what is just and right in the land. Under his rule, Judah will enjoy safety and Jerusalem will live in security. At that time, Jerusalem will be called the Lord has provided us with justice. For I, the Lord, promise David will never lack a successor to occupy the throne over the nation of Israel. Nor will the Levitical priest ever lack someone to stand before me and continually offer up burnt sacrifices, sacrifice cereal offerings, and offer the other sacrifices. The Lord spoke further to Jeremiah. I, the Lord, make the following promise. I have made a covenant with the day and with the night that they will always come at their proper times. Only if you people could break that covenant could my covenant with my servant David and my covenant with the Levites ever be broken. So David will by all means always have a descendant to occupy his throne as king and the Levites will by all means always have priests who will minister before me. I will make the children who follow one another in the line of my servant David very numerous. I will also make the Levites who minister before me very numerous. I will make them all as numerous as the stars in the sky and as the sands which are on the seashore. The Lord spoke still further to Jeremiah. You have surely noticed what these people are saying, haven't you? They are saying, The Lord has rejected the two families of Israel and Judah that he chose. So they have little regard that my people will ever again be a nation. But I, the Lord, make the following promise. I have made a covenant governing the coming of day and night. I have established the fixed laws governing heaven and earth. Just as surely as I have done this, so surely will I never reject the descendants of Jacob. Nor will I ever refuse to choose one of my servant David's descendants to rule over the descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Indeed, I will restore them and show mercy to them. It's interesting to me, God, that a lot of people don't read the Old Testament. You know I find the Old Testament fascinating, not only because of the history, but because we get to see your true nature, uh, the power of who you are, your sovereignty, 
um, your wrath and your anger and, and your disciplinary actions of these groups of people. But I know a lot of people who don't like the Old Testament. They don't like the Old Testament for those specific reasons. Uh, because they say in the Old Testament, God is mean, and in the New Testament, Jesus is nice. <laughs> I don't think that they've read the Bible clear enough, because in the New Testament, Jesus isn't always nice. <laughs> also, in the Old Testament, you're not always mean, as people put it. There's not always this vengeful, angry God throughout the Old Testament. In fact, I see you as more grace-filled than anywhere else in the Bible. You know, you didn't have to do any of these things for Judah and Israel. You didn't even need to call them your people and make this covenant with them to say, you are my people. I will show mercy on all the stupid things you've done and I will provide security. You didn't even need to make a covenant with them. You could have sent them off to exile for 70 years and not even explain to them what was happening. But you took it one step further and you said, not only am I sending you into exile for 70 years, I'm going to send a prophet to give you a heads up that this is happening. I'm going to tell you why I am doing it. Then I'm going to make a covenant with you to provide security and stability for you during those 70 years. I want you to learn during those 70 years why I have brought this discipline onto you so that you will draw back as my people. Then you take it even a step further in reading these chapters in Jeremiah. You tell Jeremiah, I want you to make something very visible to them. I want you to buy a piece of property that they think is going to be lost when the Babylonians come and take them over, when they possess them. This piece of paper, this document for this, this plot of land is going to become a valuable reminder to them that there is something waiting for them to come back. I am bringing them back to something more. I am bringing them back to the land that I promised them. And that promise is still intact. How crazy awesome God is it that you didn't have to do any of that. You didn't have to provide security for them. You didn't have to show them that there was an opportunity for them to come back after 70 years. You didn't have to make it clear that they were going to always have access to you and always have that love and affection from you. You could have just been a vengeful, angry God at that point. They deserved it. We all deserve it. <laughs> Not just Judah and Jerusalem, but they deserved it. They deserved to have your full wrath because of all the things they were doing, including uh, the other gods that they were worshiping and uh, sacrificing their children to these gods. But you didn't. There was this amazing overwhelming kindness that showed up that says even though I am disciplining you number one you need to know this discipline is because I love you I am sending you into exile to remind you first and foremost for Pete's sakes who I am I am not one of these common gods you worship I am the God I am your God I am your father number two I'm sending you into exile to be away from the people I'm going to destroy through disease, through war, you are going to actually be safe in Babylon. While you're in Babylon, I'm giving you the 70 years to reflect on what our relationship should mean, to reflect on the covenant I have made with your ancestors, the covenant I have made with you. And then I am handing you this promise because I love you so much so that you know that I am not just sending you away from me, I am bringing you back. I'm going to show you this full restoration in advance of these 70 years. I'm going to show you I am bringing you back as my people to glorify me. I'm bringing you back to the land I promised you because I made that promise to you and I love you. God, you didn't need to do any of that. It's in your full right and power to not do those things. But like I said, I tend to see more of your kindness and compassion in the Old Testament than I actually do in the New Testament. There's so many things that you did for your people throughout the whole Old Testament that you didn't need to do. They were belligerent, just like we're belligerent. <laughs> and you, you swoop down and you say, I, I need to discipline you. I love you so much. I need to do this. 
you need to understand that what you're doing is wrong because I love you so much. I'm not worried about what you think. I'm not worried about what other people think as I send you off into exile. I love you so much that all I care about is you and your future and your relationship with me. And I know what I am doing is going to bring me glory. And God, it did. We know that these stories from the Old Testament bring you glory. And I can only hope that as you work in my life, as you discipline me, and, and sometimes I know why the discipline's there. Other times I need to learn why I'm being disciplined because I'm being a little bit clueless. That even in that same process that you are glorified in, in my life, when I am exiled, when I am sent away to learn something, when I'm chastised, that even in those times you are glorified. People looking into my life shouldn't, shouldn't be able to say, oh, God doesn't love Janelle because he's disciplining her. It should be quite the opposite. He loves her so much that he's willing to do something that's really hard and discipline her so that she learns and she becomes a better Christian and she can do more work for him. God, I also ask for my heart to be right as I go into those exile times, as I go into those discipline times, that I am contrite for what I did, that I offer heartfelt apologies to you, and most importantly, that my heart changes and I grow from learning through that discipline that you've given me, that I become stronger in those areas so that those weaknesses don't stop me from being everything you created me to be. God, I thank you for being tough on me. I thank you for loving me enough to be willing to do that. Most people in my life aren't. Most people in my life don't love me enough to tell me the hard things or help me do the hard things or allow me to go through the hard things so I learn. But I know that you do. In your son's name, I pray. Amen.